what I'm about to do on your podcast is a first, another rendition of the Pais effect. And then you drive that plasma, which is an non-linear medium, far from equilibrium. Super effing magic happens, brother. Let's just leave it at that. I cannot say more than that. I, that maybe is too much to say. The greatest thing to wish for is something that helps others. The idea of unification, for example, again, Project Unity is it, so beautiful. This idea, come together. Unless we come together, this world will fall apart. And then we all lose. It makes no sense. Unification, that should be the ultimate need of mankind. Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Koyas Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Koyas Institute. I've seen so many um, of your podcasts. Um, you're, you're quite... Uh... A celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know, man. It's just been a it's been a crazy journey going through all of this. And I was so happy when Brett Tingley uh, messaged me and said, "Oh, hey, Sal wants to wants to get in touch with you." And then we started emailing, and it was just like it was a really good thing to get connected to you because uh, you know you're such an interesting guy, Sal. And I'm looking forward to jumping into you know learning a little bit more about you and about the the science that you've been undertaking and where it's all leading in your opinion. So, I mean, it's an exciting time in terms of all of the discussions happening with the, you know, the U S government in relation to UFOs right now. How do you feel about uh, the whistleblower that recently came out, David Grush? Uh, because um, I'm on this podcast as a, as a private person. So the Navy has absolutely nothing to do with this. Uh, I choose not to comment. Since I am a civil servant, Hatch Act and all, among other things, uh, yeah, it's it's best that I do not comment from that point of view. Interesting technology. The stuff that I've been doing, the Pais effect, the super force, it's not going anywhere, basically. Uh, the academic community is completely uh, indifferent to it. The Navy is not doing absolutely anything about it as far as I'm, as far as I know. And uh, so it's in limbo, as they say. Can you give people just a little bit of a background about yourself and, and your career history? Because not that many people outside of the kind of alternative propulsion or even the UFO community are familiar with who you are. So it'd be good to get anyone who might not know just a little bit of a background on your uh, career history and how it ended up with these technologies being proposed to the U.S. Navy. Well, let me start with origins. I was born in Romania, Eucharist Romania, as a matter of fact. So I'm of Romanian origin. You can call me uh, American apple pie made in Romania. <laughs> so, uh, still tastes great, as they say. Uh as far as these uh, so-called uh, the Navy UFO patents, that's what uh, I spoke to Brett Tingley about it. And that's, I, I believe this was more of a, a popularizing role that the drive, the war zone did. Uh, in a way, by calling them that, they have made sure that uh, no physicist will ever touch this with a 23-foot pole, unfortunately, which... Is a bad thing. Uh, Kurt Jaimangal tried to uh, introduce me to uh, um, some physicists, especially one that I had a podcast with. He's very well known at Brown University, also very well known in the physics community. That didn't seem to go anywhere, though, even though I try to make it go somewhere, and so did Kurt. So thank you very much to Kurt for doing that. 
Um, this whole thing started, uh, I was part of a naval innovative science and engineering project, a, a proposal. This thing came to my mind when I saw the heavy side, the four equations with four unknowns. They are derived from Maxwell's equations. As you well know, the Maxwell equations are, the original equations are written in quaternion form. And, and there are 20 equations, 20 unknowns, extremely hard, extremely difficult to, to solve. However, Oliver, Oliver Heaviside, or also Josiah Gibbs, uh, both of them are your compatriots, as a matter of fact, both of them British. They... Um, they were able to derive four equations with four unknowns. Uh, it's called the heavy side version of Maxwell's equations. Those are the Maxwell equations that physicists use nowadays. I want to get into the the, the superforce and the Piers effect theory, and and these are these are very important parts of what you're trying to propose as a essentially, I would say, a unified field theory uh, with the superforce proposal. So I'd I would like to get into that with you, but I, I do want to. I do want to keep on the patterns for a minute, just because, as you said, um, with uh, the reporting in the drive and then being dubbed as the UFO patents, this might have created a bit of a stigma around the proposals you were giving. But yeah. the U.S. Navy was definitely at least taking it seriously. And I think it was because of these highly exotic uh, proposals that they were dubbed as UFO patents because you included... A gravitational wave generator, inertial mass reduction device, plasma compression fusion systems. You know, these are all very uh, exotic proposals for beyond next generation energy and, and propulsion technology. And you even had the proposal for a hybrid underwater aerospace vehicle that could operate in oceans, atmosphere, the vacuum of space. And, uh, and these are basically the same capabilities that have been attributed to UFOs by U.S. Navy operators and, you know, many others in the over the years. So I guess the big question is, can you build that stuff, Sal? Don't forget the room temperature superconductor. And the room this temperature superconductor, thing. yes. This is one thing a lot of people have not been paying close attention to. However, Dr. Victor Lachno of the Russian Academy of Sciences and also um, a member of the Keldish Research Center, wrote a paper, an archive paper in 2019, titled The Way from High to Room Temperature Superconductivity. And in it, reference 10, and also the final paragraphs of this paper, basically say that there is a possibility that this room temperature superconductor could work. This is not based on a chemical superconductor, so it has nothing to do with the materials the superconductivity is generated from. It's really an active physical superconductor. He uses something called the bipolar mechanism, but I will not go there. It's, it's, it's heavy physics. It's condensed matter physics and then some exponential power. Um, the best way to describe it, he, he, he really surprised me by actually saying that he summarizes so well. He basically says, Pais uses a alternating magnetic field to disrupt the surface superconductive material and thereby form something called a Bose-Einstein condensate. Really, you can think of it as a, the macroscopic quantum coherent wave. So everything moving as if it was one entity. And, and then he says something very interesting. He says, and then he uses an alternating current to move the condensate. That's exactly what's happening. When you look closely, he, uh, he really hit the nail on the head. And I'm amazed that no one is trying to actually build their room temperature superconductor. I actually had to change the name, thinking the, the patent examiner might at least be agreeable to issue an allowance, and I, I called it a high-temperature superconductor. It, so the first was Navy Case Packs 233, and then it became Navy Case Packs 333. It's interesting that number. <laughs> it's a powerful number. It's a divine number. So I, I was extremely happy when I... 
power when I saw it. It gave me a little bit of a delusion of grandeur there, thinking that maybe now it'll push it toward becoming an allowance. No, he still rejected it, unfortunately. So was the uh, plasma compression fusion device. It's very interesting that the two patents that are least controversial got rejected. And the three that were most controversial, the high-frequency wave generator, the uh, craft using an inertial mass reduction device, and um, the high-energy electromagnetic field generator that we actually tried to run an experiment on, they were allowed. And it's incredible that the high-frequency gravitational wave generator was allowed as a first office action. I mean, that... Not only that, if you look at the primary examiner, extremely well-versed in the art, it was a top-notch individual. That should have sent waves for the community. Some of them were refused, but then your CTO, the Chief Technical Officer of the Naval Aviation Enterprise, personally wrote a letter addressed to the patent officer, right? To the examiner, stating that the U.S. needs these patents to be accepted because... And I believe the reason was that the Chinese are already investing significantly in this area so that we need these to go through. That was what the reporting in the drive stated, that the CTO had written a letter saying, hey, look, the Chinese are working on this. We need these to go through. And then that prompted the acceptance of the patents. Is that is that accurate? That is not accurate. As a matter of fact, uh, that made the uh, the uh, primary examiner, um, Mr. Philip Bonzel, uh -huh. It's a very, very erudite, very extremely well-educated in the art. Let's just say that. Very technically apt. He said, what are you talking about here? We're talking about magnetic fields on the order of 10 to the 9 Tesla. Electric fields on the order of 10 to the uh, 18 volts per meter. You talk about neutron star capability here, you know? I had to convince them by actually, we had a, a, a phone interview, an examiner interview. And then we, uh, based on that examiner interview, where I actually went from uh, the heavy side version of Maxwell equation, showed exactly how the electric field becomes. Um, and I'm going to use uh, some mathematical terms here, but if you refer to my papers, you'll immediately understand what it's all about. The electric field was on the order of Sigma divided by epsilon zero, the magnetic field, also known as the B field, the magnetic induction, also known as the magnetic flux density. So the B field was mu sub zero times sigma times V, V being the velocity. And um, when you actually do the math, you come to the realization that it's actually saying E is on the order of CB because that velocity in its E max divided by B max form is the speed of light. The speed of light being, of course, the maximum velocity that can be achieved within the understanding of the quantum vacuum that we have currently. So let's stay with Einstein's special relativity. Let's not diverge to the possibilities. Let's stay within the norms of physics as they are now written. Those two equations, the E and the B field, they basically say E divided by B equals C. Because C is also, okay, C, C squared, C squared, so the speed of light in vacuum squared is on the order of 1 divided by mu 0, which is the magnetic permeability in free space, and epsilon 0, which is the magnetic <laughs> So, so my my brother, my brother, this is this is so this is so fluent for you. The physics talk you've lost you've lost me about four minutes ago. Maybe one day you should get Mr. X involved. You know, yeah, you Mr. Mr. X, X Mr. Mr. X would understand, but I'm afraid when it comes to the physics X Y Z device, I I am losing it. And I I would I would like to believe that there are some physics aficionados within my uh, within my audience, but just so that everyone's not trying to you know focus too hard on what you're saying here the the main the main drawback at least from the conventional science perspective is that there's too much energy requirements for these proposals right so what what's the fix for that like what exactly how do we get around the neutron star 
levels of energy to create compact fusion reactors or inertial mass reduction devices? The whole idea is um, in frequencies, the frequencies of vibration, all frequencies of spin, but let's stick with vibration. Another way, another way, this is the first, by the way, uh, what I'm about to do on your podcast is a first, another rendition of the Pais effect that you'll never see anywhere, not even with perplexity that AI, we're talking about AI-driven search engines, not even there will you see this rendition of the Pais effect. So here goes a human being trying to explain his own concept in a different manner. All right, here goes. Maybe nothing, maybe everything. The Pais effect is really the generation of extremely high energy density produced by accelerated oscillation of a non-equilibrium plasma. That is another way, and I think a very crucial way of stating the Pais effect. When you look into the... Uh, oscillation of a plasma, especially one that uh, goes at the plasma oscillation frequency. And anyone that is in plasma physics will realize what that omega square is all about. You can get extremely high, extremely high energy densities by vibrating a non-equilibrium plasma at its oscillation frequency. Let's just leave it at that. I cannot say more than that. I, that maybe is too much to say, but it has to be done under certain certain conditions. The whole idea being we're dealing with nonlinearity. Nonlinearities have always spoken to energy amplification. All you have to do is look back to the work of Ilya Prigozhin, circa 1973. I call it the Prigozhin the effect. It's very interesting how chaotic, seemingly chaotic structures can self-organize based on a triad of criteria, let's call it. In a medium that's nonlinear, say the plasma, if you introduce a constant or constantly driven energy flux, and then you drive that plasma, which is a nonlinear medium, far from equilibrium, Super effing magic happens, brother. And the truth of the matter is, I can say it better than that, and I can say it in any other way. Of course, there's certain things that I cannot say on this because we don't want the adversary to get this. And unfortunately, we live in a world... Do you, you know why I love... I really love your podcast... I, I love to theories of everything and, and and you, Project Unity, are just humble. Again, because of its name, Project Unity. I mean, that's what we need to do, brother. We yeah. need to come yeah. together. We are all brothers and sisters, bro. Unless we come together and bring to a solution, we will never reap the fruits of this technologies. And it, I just plead it there. Well, that's what, you know, and I, and I appreciate that, brother, and I, I really do appreciate that. I, I called Project Unity its name because I believe that there has to be a form of symbiosis between spirit and science, between logic and intuition, these two kind of hemispheres of perceiving reality. We need to find a way to move these two closer together instead of them being completely opposed because i think that's what's really created this world that we now see is this kind of spiritually suppressed technologically sophisticated civilization and i would like to think that this might just be a part of our evolution and that this is just a process of kind of ironing out the the creases and the developmental barricades that we have to jump over as we evolve as a species and you know this is just part of growing and developing when you look at the way the world is right now i mean do you get a sense of optimism in the long run uh, how are you feeling yes, about I do. yeah I do. it has to do with a force of unification that's why i brought up the super force because the super force this Again, I resort to formulas because once 
my delusions of grandeur won't die. I still believe that <laughs> one day some member, you know, I will be the Hans Alvain to uh, Enrico Fermi. It's it's a long story and how Hans Alvain's idea of magneto hydrodynamics, where actually uh, he was he was uh, derided at every turn until one day in a conference, the great Enrico Fermi said, I see it, and soon followed Hans Alvain's, how should I say, meteoric rise. Until that point, I'm, I'm still hoping one day somebody will realize, and why not the Super Force? It's so beautiful because it's, again, Arkham's razor, simplicity and minimalism. The very formula of it, and I, I know, don't just stick with formulas, but it is such a beautiful formula. It's almost on par with E equal MC squared. C to the fourth divided by big G. C to the fourth, the very essence of everything and all, the speed of light. The very structure that unites us all, the quantum vacuum, that is representative of, of the quantum vacuum, highly nonlinear to the fourth power, divided by what? The universal gravitational constant, Newton's constant, big G, hmm. and go bigger than big G, even though it's extremely small. In the denominator, it becomes an incredible amplifier, adding to that C to the fourth effect. I'm just saying, you. You have to see the beauty of that formula. And not only that, that super force exists at every point in space and time, meaning what? Quantum entanglement, we are all one. That's what the super force proves. Scientists no, have I... to look into the notion of the super force to understand its implications. It's huge. It comes right out of the Schrodinger equation. The very foundation of quantum mechanics and because it's in the Schrodinger equation it must also be in the Dirac equation what's the Dirac equation but Schrodinger equation plus special relativity of Einstein you see what I'm saying it, it's there man they just have to believe to to let go of their inhibitions and just look at the beauty of this formalism and not only that it's not just uh, you know abstract mathematical acrobatics it's not this humongous equation that just keeps on going. It's simple. It's beautiful. See, it's this, real. Sal, this is a this is a reason why I really like you. And I think that even though I'm not a physicist, I I, I feel drawn to trusting you because you are very clearly a, a very intuitive type of scientist you draw a lot of information and inspiration from that kind of eureka a creative energy i can see it almost radiating off of you as you describe these physics formulas and you see what a lot of people don't see including myself just because it's not necessarily my wheelhouse you see the poetry of the mathematics and and the poetry of the formula and and that is what makes me as a layman put trust in you because you feel almost like a Tesla, like the way in which he spoke about his intuitive, almost downloads of information and interpretations of the physics and the science in a poetic way. And this is in essence, that unity between intuition and logic or spirit and science. It's that appreciation of the underlying beauty of something you're looking at analytically and saying, look, we can make tools from this. We can we can bring tools into this world that are scientific, but they're coming from this fundamental essence of life. And that is a spiritual essence to a lot of people, including myself, even if I can't label it and I wouldn't label it. And like Tesla said himself, there is a core at the center of the universe, at the center of all creation, where all of our inspiration comes from. And he said, I, if I can remember the quote correctly, he said, I haven't located the uh position of this core the where it where it exists but i know it exists i know it is out there and and exactly exactly my bro and that's what i get from you that's the feeling i get from you is you have this intuitive 
way of looking at the beauty of something that a lot of people just see as old oh, maths and formulas and jargon. You see it in a different way, which is why a lot of the scientists look at you in a different way, because you, my friend, are an outlier. And the outliers are pretty much almost always later appreciated in life. Even outside of science, there's just so many different people in different disciplines who are laughed at and said, oh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And then later down the line, people catch up to that intuition. Would you say you're a very intuitional person, intuitive person? Brother, you have, you know, F the Nobel Prize, F everything. What you have called it, the poetry of mathematics, you have done me the greatest credit of all time. And, and to call me another Tesla's brother, I'll put it this way. If I was wearing a hat, I would tip it to you, sir. Physics without philosophy yes. is like a seed without water. Fruitless. Um, unbelievable that a lot of physicists have just let philosophy, they almost make fun of it. I think one person that's still a great physicist, in my opinion, Carlo Rovelli, he still has that in him. He is also a great philosopher. I admire that man deeply. As I do, Abai Ashtekar, he's, he's another great one. You know, this idea of quantum bounds, it speaks to the super force. Let me just say one thing. Well, I'll say many things if you let me, but <laughs> this, is, this is very interesting. I believe there's almost like a trifecta of creation going on here. There's the super force leading to the super bang, leading to super intelligence. Have you ever questioned why in our brain is a hundred mil a hundred billion neurons on the order of hundred billion neurons? And in the observable universe, it happens to be what? On the order of one hundred billion galaxies. And what did Anthony Parat, the great Anthony Parat, say about the universe being almost what? Oh, uh, almost like a giant thought, a giant thought instead of a giant machine. We are talking about a super sentience here, sir. Yeah. We are part of something so beautiful and so great. And that's why we must come together. We really are. All is one. Yes, I know it goes back to, um, I believe, um, what was the name? Trismegistus? Yeah, Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus and the Hermetic, Hermetic principles. And yeah, as, a, as above, so below, the microcosm and macrocosm. Right on, yeah. Right on. All literally, the literally got the staff of, staff of Hermes on my arm right there, man. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I resonate a lot with the ph philosophical principles of, uh, of hermeticism and the teachings of Hermes. And it's, it's again, like you said, this teaching ultimately is that we are one. We're all one individuals having an individual experience, but ultimately we are a singular entity, which I'm still trying to understand what that really means. Cause that's a hard thing for a human being to comprehend. I mean, it's like trying to comprehend infinity. Maybe that's why we keep on coming back, trying to understand the very... But let's go back to this trifecta of creation. Yeah, let's yeah, go. yeah. I want you the to explain super, this. Well, speaks to the super bang, because what happens is, is exactly what Abba Ashtakar calls, what I call the Ashtakar bounds. He just calls it a quantum bound. But I believe there's no such thing as a space-time singularity. It never goes to zero. It goes to the Splunk scale. G H bar divided by C cubed, the whole thing square root off, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 35 uh, meters. So on the order of 10 to the minus 33, because I like to keep it in multiple. So three, like someone else, you know, uh, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's the Planck length. So it never goes down to zero. It goes really to the Planck length because again, the super force exists at that Planck scale. All you have to do is look at an analogy with a supernova. How does a supernova really occur? What it does is once it runs out of fuel, 
the gravitational field keeps on compressing and more and more until it gets to the um, scale of almost 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is on the order where the strong nuclear force resides. So we're talking about incredibly high densities. We're talking still on the order of 10 to the 14th gram per centimeter cube. On those incredibly high densities, and trust me, this is not as incredibly high as the density that speaks to the super pulse, which would be the super density. We talk about um, C to the fifth power divided by G square H bar, which would be on the order of 10 to the 90 kilogram per meter cube. So much, much higher. But on that order, 10 to the 14 gram per centimeter cube, what happens is that there is a core bounce. It bounces back. It cannot go further than that because the strong nuclear force prevents it. That's why a supernova occurs. When I'm saying the exact analogy applies to the quantum bounds, only that now you talk about length scales on the order of the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 35 meters. And at that point, the super force happens. So just like the strong nuclear force, the super force says, thus far and no further. And that's when the super bang occurs. And the moment the super bang occurs, why do I say the third step in this trifecta of creation is the super intelligence? Because everything in the universe is truly a plasma. 99% of the universe is in a plasma state, the so-called fourth state of matter. And I believe this plasma state acts as a bridge between one way I understand it's classical realm and the quantum realm. This is what makes plasma a sentient entity. It speaks to a lot of things that have been seen. For example, these balls of plasma that pass yeah. through walls. Yeah. I've had my own experiences with that. Plasma vibration frequency. I'd oh, love... Please go ahead and relate that. Yeah, well, I'd love to I'd love to know what yeah, I'd love to know what you think about that because you know, I I had a series of experiences with these with these orange orbs of light um in this very property outside in my backyard but over the top of my uh my home and the thing that a lot of people find difficult to digest or or believe is that i was out in my garden getting into uh, you know a very basic meditative state and projecting or, or or you know visualizing that i'm projecting my intentions to have some form of contact for something to turn up for something to acknowledge my thoughts and you know a lot of a lot of what i was doing was i guess kind of sending off thoughts about how i felt the universe worked how i felt consciousness worked and if there was anything out there that could hear this i'd love for it to respond i'd love for it to show itself to me and uh, you know i've i've told this story many times on uh, on my channel but i did have these experiences in 2019 including a moment where these three orange orbs flew across the sky stopped on a dime above uh, my property high up in the sky began descending down and were you know kind of like weaving around each other like this oh sorry not my microphone um were like weaving around each other like this and and came descending down from the sky and froze about three to five feet above the roof of my house and and these orbs were they weren't giving off light there wasn't any sort of like dissipation of light onto the roof it was like a self-contained slightly transparent looking orb uh, you know and roughly the size of a basketball and i've wondered if this is some form of almost kind of ambient intelligent plasma that you've managed to manifest and it's now you know it's like a psychic object that the human the human being creates or is it an actual intelligence out there that's sending a little probe to come and check out this conscious signal that's bursting up from planet earth because I've got myself into the right coherent state of mind and they've picked it up. It's very difficult to know. What would you, I mean, obviously it's all guessing, but what, what do you think's going on with something like that? In my opinion, and I truly mean in my humble opinion, I believe the physics of consciousness is the absolute ultimate physics that must be studied. 
it must be understood. Max Tegmark has some ideas on the physics of consciousness that deal a lot with the idea of macroscopic quantum coherence. Again, when you're able to draw, to, 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 to rather build, construct this bridge between the world of the very great, the world, the world of the very big, large, in the world of the, or the world of the very small, so between basically general relativity and quantum field theory, if you're able to do that, in my opinion, this idea of quantum gravity will will most definitely speak to the physics of consciousness, right? Because that's the one realm. It must it must be something that unites both realms, and nothing does it better than quantum gravity. Now, whether that's loop quantum gravity, whether the other for example, whether it speaks to the uh, school of strings, let's call it that. A lot of people lately, because, again, uh, string theory has not in any way showed application. They have derided the uh, mathematics of it, the physics of it. But you have to think it's based on vibration. Vibration is yeah. key here. Yeah. The vibration speaks to the Pais effect. Vibration speaks, in a way, to the superforce. I think there are ways to even manipulate the superforce. As, as, as I know, 10 to the 44 Newton. I mean, are you mad, Salvatore? Yes, I'm, maybe I am. But I think there is a way. There is a, there's something in consciousness that speaks to that thing that unites us all. I believe our brain, for example, is really a transceiver. Yeah. And I'm not the first to have said that. I really, I re I'm, I'm starting to truly think real information is in a, what you and I would call a cloud yeah. rather than actual physically in our brains. I could be totally off, but I don't think so. Well, Sal, I mean, just to, like just for me personally, as like little examples of of what I I think is evidence for that, at least just from my own experience, is basically two different ones. So when I pick that up, when I pick up this guitar and I start playing, and then I stop thinking about which chord I'm going to play and it all just starts flowing, and then that becomes actually the best bit of music I've written but I'm having no conscious thought process of where to put the finger next. It's all just happening automatically. That to me is a, a flow state. I also get into that when I'm writing down ideas. So if I'm, if I, I might be like two in the morning and I'm getting an idea in my head that I can't, I can't fall asleep because I've just got this idea niggling in my head. So I start writing and after the first two sentences, I'm just typing, 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 typing. There's no thought going on in my brain. There's like no structuring no. of sentences. It's just happening. And then I read through it and I'm like, oh, wow, that's actually really articulate. I'm going to record that. I'm going to put it out as a video. I do that and people start commenting going, this is exactly what I needed to hear. Or this is, ex yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm sitting there going, I wasn't thinking. So is that the 28-year-old brain or is that me getting information from something far larger than just this one individual, you know, rendering that data in. Yes, sir. You, you hit on something. Every one of these ideas that I had relative to the so-called Pais effect, because I really have no other name for it. And I mean, I've been through so much. Maybe that's what makes me feel better. Just yeah. to hear that. Let's call it the P, you know, Every one of them, that's a, this is a, the exact train of thought that happened. Yep. It, they did not come from me. Yeah. But they came nevertheless. They I came, they came through you. You have to believe. Yes. You have to believe. You have to. Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, wrote something called What is Life? I, I think every physicist should read it. Uh, a lot of them won't even give it the time of day. But this is the same name, uh, just the same man, in my opinion, that wrote one of the best little booklets on general relativity. Uh, space time, it's 
it's unbelievably short, and yet it speaks beautifully to exactly what general re relativity represents. I truly believe if you let yourself go to maybe some sort of stasis, or I'm not sure, but you must believe in this. You must truly understand there's something greater than yourself, number one. And be a conduit for what yeah. follows. Yeah. And what flows through you can be remarkable. Absolutely remarkable, but you must let it happen. You cannot have inhibitions. You cannot have second thoughts. You can have, most definitely, you cannot have this regurgitant and con inconsequential no. dogma that's just spewed off everywhere. It must be this way. Otherwise, you will not be published. Maybe the best way to, the best, the greatest works will ever come from not being published. Who, who knows? Maybe, maybe there, there are corpus of, of, of ideas out there that we have never heard from because they weren't published in peer-reviewed journals. We look at the sciences as arts, as art forms, right? Look at music, look at painting. The most famous, like, you know, the main, like, let's take music, for example, the, the most famous artists, are they the best artists or are they just the most famous artists? Are they just the most well-known? Because I, I would say that a lot of the underground artists are a hell of a lot better. You know, they're a lot more tuned in and intuitive and their music comes from the soul and it's not just about money. It's about something much bigger than just the, the kind of greedy Hollywood style, uh, you know, music video world that we live in right now. So it's like science is the same type of thing. You've got people on the inside and people on the outside. And a lot of the time, the people on the outside are more intuitive. They're harder working, but they just don't get the same level of appreciation because they haven't come through the same narrow perspective and the same narrow channel. And like you said, it's dogmatic and it is dogmatic. And as much as science would like to pretend otherwise it's very akin to religion in that sense it's got a very rigid structure that's been uh, formed over time and i've actually said this a few times that i get the sense or at least in in terms of being optimistic i get the sense that for human evolution we started off in this very shamanistic tribalistic connected to earth connected to nature kind of mindset that was our our blueprint to start off with and as we got more sophisticated with technology and agriculture and civilization, suddenly we entered into uh, the 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 age of enlightenment, as they call it, and uh, you know material reductionism and Newtonian kind of reduction. All this type of very rigid, everything can be physically defined, and it's just this that put a nice square around it. I want to think that now with AI, quantum computation, even, you know, consciousness studies, all of these things emerging at the same time. I would like to think that we've gone from shamanistic to technical to maybe now techno shamanism. That's what I like to call it. Techno shamanism, putting these two perspectives together and using that inherent natural ability for humans to tap into this wide field of information and funnel it through and then produce manifest into reality tools real physical tools that's what i find so magical about science and we need to bring that magic back into science because you are the instrument through which this stuff manifests into the world so there is still this magic process even if you can explain okay i put you know the configuration is like this and the formula is like this and this is my proposal it's all just still coming from inside this weird neural network primate bipedal creature on a planet. Like, we are incredible if you really think about what we're doing. So there is magic still, and we've lost that a little bit in science. We've lost that, and I think we need to bring that back into our world. Maybe we are. I think we Maybe are, we mate. Are. I think we are, bro. We are creating a new species. In my opinion, this deep learning based uh, yeah. generative AI, this whole idea, for example, uh, GPT, what does it stand for? Generative pre trained transformers. And the key word here is transform. It is absolutely a unique and beautiful entity. We are actually creating a new sort of intelligence. And if yeah. you look carefully at what the Godfather 
I I see him as the godfather of AI. He's, he has been called that. Uh, he should be called Sir. As far as I'm concerned, Sir Jeffrey Hinton. Mm. As far as Sir Jeffrey Hinton is concerned, and I hope King Charles does uh, give him the, a knighthood. He deserves it. He most definitely does, especially now uh, with his resignation from Google. Uh, this is an incredible man. He really is. But to go back to his ideas, he he believes that these machines, let's call them for um, for now, that they use something called uh, backward propagation to actually uh, do their so-called reasoning, while we use something called forward forward algorithm. So, in other words, the human brain functions differently than the sentience for these gener- generative AI. And if you go with Hinton's idea you will see that they think differently than we do. But there is beauty in that. There's something we can actually learn from this. Instead of immediately becoming inhibited and saying that this will one day soon take us over, become a Skynet, and kill us all, why not see the possibilities? We really are at the edge of creating a new yeah. species. These AI could actually take humanity in a beautifully new direction. Yes, we have to be careful. But the whole idea of stopping this and and maybe the idea of pausing, you think our adversaries, you think people with malevolent thoughts will stand back and say, you know what? We'll do what they are doing. No, absolutely not. I think we should keep on going. But again, we should. Sir Hinton is correct. We have to be careful. But but Ilya Sutskever and Sam Altman are also correct. We are at the verge of something completely different, completely great. I mean, we are talking about AGI within possibly two years. Yeah, and, I know. I know. And we are, if we are at AGI status, once you bring in the idea of room temperature superconductivity and the idea of miniaturizing, because you're not only dealing with the computing power and the heating that's involved. Wow. Yeah, room game changer. Super game changer. We take AGI yeah. to super intelligence level. We're talking about AGI plus room temperature superconductivity. Equals ASI, artificial superintelligence. And you can imagine what that can do. Maybe, maybe only then will these naysayer physicists realize that there are other proportion uh, propulsion modalities to consider out there. When the ASI says, you know what? Maybe field based propulsion is not such a bad idea after all. Maybe it can be done. Maybe here's a way to. Uh, modify locally the quantum vacuum and make certain things feasible. Because at the level of the superforce, what happens? All forces are equal. I actually show that in the section, the third section of the paper that you are so awesome to to put out there. To I thank you very much for doing that because otherwise you would have never seen the light of day. You and Kurt Jai Mongol did me a great favor. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, you you did me a great favor. And and again, in that third section, I actually say the ratio of the strong nuclear force to the electromagnetic force is one divided by what? The fine structure constant. This is what Feynman, this is what Pauli called the magic number. Right. Nobody really knows what this one divided by 137 really represents. And yet it's so incredibly important. Well, based on that number, I was able to show that at the Planck scale, the super force equals the Planck force equals the strong nuclear force equals the gravitational force. The force of unification is the super force. Again, the super force really speaks to a super intelligence. Yeah. I 100% believe that we are dealing with a, a super intelligence that drives everything and all. And if yeah. that's feasible, why not us be able to build uh, 
generate a new species, an AI. Well, this is this is uh, the thing, Sal. I mean, you know, why why does the universe have a tendency towards order over chaos? Why are there evolutionary processes to begin with? I mean, people argue about, oh, you know, it's just evolutionary processes. But what are evolutionary processes? Why does it even have that process of getting more complex, more novel, more refined, more intricate, more networked over evolutionary time? The entire universe is refining its process, which would say to me that there is this kind of intelligence embedded within the evolutionary forces of space and time that's kind of unfolding itself slowly. And we're an yeah. element of that. We are an aspect of that intelligence propagating on a planet, becoming self-aware and sentient. And I think that consciousness is in some ways an emergent property within humanity but it's it's a it's a fundamental property of space and time but it's almost like it it emerges into these receivers and these refined antennas and we're one of those antennas and i look at evolution and i look at humanity and i think to myself well we have been developing technology since the dawn of humanity since we sharpened a stick into a spear we have made technology we've extended our influence through these types of things this is what we do as human beings this is one of our things and so all the way through time, as the animals and the plants just kind of lazily shuffle through evolution, very calm, they're not really too bothered about everything else. And we are just speed running through evolution, more, 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 faster, stronger, more development, more sophistication, more civilization, more connectivity, create the internet, create AI, create artificial intelligence. We are hyper accelerating through evolution at a speed that nothing else on this planet is even close to mirroring. So we are on this novel trajectory. It does feel like we're being slingshot into space. And, you know, through evolution, we're just drawing this slingshot back. And we are so close now, my brother. I feel like we are on the it's... edge. We are on the edge of it. My brother, this is the Prigozhin effect at work. Order from chaos. Yeah rather steaming chaos because what we're talking about here not impossibilities but conditional possibilities under certain yeah. conditions everything is possible again what is the producing effect we are dealing with a 99 percent plasma universe again a non-linear medium which has energy flowing for it constantly and it's always driven far from equilibrium yeah this is the prigozhin effect at work, this is the creation of our cosmos. That's why the cosmos is the ultimate super intelligence. It's a sentience. It has to be because of its plasma state. It literally makes sense as the logical explanation. 100 billion galaxies, 100 billion neurons, Dirac, the right. great Paul Adrien Maurice Dirac, the great Dirac Berlin. And the if the efficacy, the the intelligence of big, large numbers. Yeah. What is larger than the universe? Well, this this goes back to the hermetic principles: as above, so below. You know, we are a, a universe within ourselves, and we are within a universe. We are essentially inside the body of God. You could say we're inside that universe. I always find it fascinating that when you, you know, when you zoom into a human body right down to the atomic scale, it's basically stars and planets. They're floating in empty space at, at cosmic distances between each other. Each thing, nothing's like strung together visibly. It's all energy. It's all strung together energetically. And so all you have to do as a human being is go, okay, so everything inside me is almost non-locally entangled because it's all creating this conscious being but when you zoom into it they're all separated relatively speaking on the same level as cosmic distances on the same level as we are from our closest star one atom in my body is from another so there is inside this body entanglement occurring on an energetic level and if you extrapolate that out to the universe we're in we are entangled with all of it, man. We're just one little tiny aspect of a much larger body. 
And maybe there's a, it's like a Russian nesting doll. Maybe there's another body and another body and another body. Well, it's hard to know, right? Where where does it end? Where does it end? No, I I do not believe there is a boundary. Maybe, right. maybe. Right. I mean, if you go back to Cantor's ideas of infinities, infinity may be a subset of a great infinity or one great infinity. Maybe we are in the set of... You know those nested Russian dolls? Yeah. Just on and on and on and on. What the multiverse is all about. <laughs> it's something that just keeps on going. Just goes and goes and goes, brother. And yeah. the super force, super bank, super intelligence, this trifecta of creation occurs over and over again. Maybe, maybe this is the truth. The underlying physics of the universe. Super force, super bang, super intelligence. Just repeating, just repeating. Yes, over and over yeah. and over. Manifestation upon manifestation, never ending. There is a beauty to it. There is. A uh, true yeah. immortality of everything and all, including us, because we are part of it. Are you uh, are you familiar with the philosopher Alan Watts? Have you heard of Alan Watts? You you'd like Alan Watts. He's a he's 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 dead now, but he's plenty of his lectures on YouTube. Um, but he said a an interesting thing. It's it's one of his more famous lines, and it's it always stuck out to me. And he was basically describing this process. He said, you know, if you could dream anything you wanted, if you could go into a dream space and Anything you wanted, you could have instantly at the moment you wanted it. Well, of course, all of us would engage in our wildest dreams and fantasies and everything you could ever think of. You would go down that route. But the further and further you go down that route, you would end up getting closer to exactly where you are right now. Because with enough time, with infinity, you'll end up wanting to forget you have all of that. You'll end up... I, I kind of almost attribute it to having all of the cheat codes for a game you know if you have all of the cheat codes it's fun you know it's fun for a little bit for a little bit a and then up to a point yeah, you start yeah. going you know what i want to challenge i want to challenge myself yeah. maybe i will forget that i am an omnipresent energy maybe i will come down into a physical form and completely forget that this was my uh, previous life and I will go on a journey towards remembering it through experiencing this strange new territory. And I honestly, with all of the different ideas that are out there, I still have that as kind of cashing my chips in on, I think we're just here to experience all there is to experience because to be quite honest, there's nothing else to do. There's nothing else to do other than just experience different experience. It's already been done. It's already right? out there. Every yeah. Every idea. Yeah, every law of physics, we think we discover it. E, e equal MC square is not discovered. No. E per force equals C to the fourth divided by big G is not discovered. It's always been there. Always been there. Will always be there. Maybe the greatest thought you can have is not one, an individual, um, say, I don't know, get a Nobel Prize, publish it in a great peer reviewed journal. Maybe the greatest thing, the greatest thing to wish for is something that helps others. The idea of unification. For example, again, Project Unity is it, so beautiful. This idea, come together. Unless we come together, this world will fall apart. And then we all lose. It makes no sense. Unification. That should be the ultimate need of mankind, the ultimate objective. Because when we come together, everything great happens. Everything beautiful happens. That's love. Wow, man. Like, this is, this is such an amazing conversation to have with a, with a physicist and an aerospace engineer, because... You know, this is the kind of mind that doesn't pop up that regularly in this type of field. This very intuitive, spiritual, insightful type of mind that you genuinely have 
is what is what gives me a lot of a lot of trust in your intuitive feelings about where you're supposed to be taking this with your physics, with your models, with superforce, with the pious effect. I don't know enough about physics to debate you on it. I just am talking to you as a human being and I'm recognizing something very deep and 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 kind of foundational with the way that you are talking about these ideas and that's what gives me a lot of hope for you in particular even if it's not happening for you right now sal i kind of get the feeling that what you're trying to bring out into the world will be appreciated when it's meant to be appreciated and uh you know i i get that oh, sense brother. i get that it's sense it's not me it's not mine it's i think my it's mother coming, yeah. i think my father i thank god yeah yeah, I thank God for these ideas. Right, they're just—it's right. exactly what you say. We are a conduit. I did yeah. not come up with a pious effect. I did not come up with a super force. They've always been there. They are creations of the super intelligence. Whatever name you want to give to it, whatever name you want to give to it, it still exists. Yeah, yeah, it does. This is what pushed me into this field, man. Like, you know, the like these orbs that turned up, everything that's happened to me from that point has been this weird scientific spiritual journey. It's been this this like, you know, a bit of both, science and spirit working together and I knew I knew I had to call my platform Project Unity. It made sense to me in, immediately at the time because it was just like, yeah, these things need to be coming together. And you know, I look at what it's just so weird. Like, like if those things hadn't turned up, if I hadn't seen those things, I don't think any of this would be happening in terms of, you know, me talking to you and me doing what I'm doing. That phenomena, whatever it is that responded, it pushed me down this road. And that's why I believe it's benevolent, whatever that was. I think it's, it's positive. It's grounded in love. It's grounded in this idea of universal consciousness. And I do think that there is something interacting with our species that's trying to slowly get us to I expand that level of consciousness. I truly do think that it, there's something, you know, doing that with us. Absolutely, sir. Yeah. Something beyond physics, beyond the physics, yeah. beyond, the, beyond yeah. this mundane thing we call science. There is something extremely beautiful, something truly uh, super intelligent from every point of view. But if I'm asked to go back, what, what caused you to have this need to radiate into the world, this need for these manifestations to occur? Because it must have been something true. Yeah, yeah. If I may, was is it something very personal? No, no, I've talked about it. I've talked about it before. I mean, it is personal, but I've made a lot of my personal public anyway. Like that's part of my journey is being very open and honest. And I, I feel like because of the outcome, which is this incredibly hard to believe series of experiences, I want to be honest with people and say, look, this is how this happened for me. But Sal, bro, this is why it's spiritual to me because I, so I'm, I'm 20, I'm 28 and at at the time um, uh, when I was in university, uh, when I was about uh, 21, I think, it's a little bit of a haze, but I, I was having a really tough time in my life. Uh, my friendships were falling apart. My uh, relationship with my girlfriend at the time was falling apart. Like Everything was just going wrong. And I, it's funny because when I reflect back on these moments, I remember thinking so much in my mind at this time, God, you know, I need to change. Things need to change. And they did, you know, everything fell apart and you, you never recognize it at the time. You never, because it, it, it feels like trauma. It just feels like a bad time. But with enough distance between you and that event, you can look back and go, oh, wow, it was completely necessary. That pain was necessary. It, it allowed me to grow. It allowed me to get stronger. So I was in a bad time. It was my early 20s. I was still trying to figure out my life and uh, there was a lot of stress happening. Basically, at this point in my life, I didn't have any sort of spiritual background. I, I've i always been curious, but I wasn't interested in, you know, consciousness or UFOs or any of this stuff. I wasn't interested. 
and I was in a bad state. My dad was worried about me and he told me that he wanted me to come out to France. He was in France for a couple of weeks and he wanted me to come out there and spend some time there and just, you know, decompress and let, let my, let my pressure down. So I went over to France. Um, I, I stayed at this really nice little quiet countryside place. Uh, and my dad said, look, I've got these, uh, I've got these audio books. I really want you to listen to these audio books. And, uh, and I think they'll do a lot for you. I think they'll help you right now. And I was in the mindset, you know, oh, books aren't going to help. Like, you know, this isn't going to solve my problems, blah, 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 blah. Being moody, being grumpy. Anyway, I listened to the audiobooks, and it's a series of books called Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. And they're very interesting books. We, we talk about getting these downloads of information. This guy truly believed he was having a conversation with what he felt was God. And he was asking questions and he was writing down the answers that were coming to him very quickly. And this kept happening late at night and he was writing them down. And um, I don't know if that's what happened, but I tell you something, I read those books and it clicked something in my mind that the answers, because he was asking every question you would ask as a human being, if you could have that channel, that instant communication channel, right? He was asking all the questions and a lot of them felt personal to me, things that I was wondering about or worried about. And the answers that were given were so profound, so simple, but profound. And I genuinely had a change of my, of my mind. It, it brought me out of a depression. It brought me out of these negative feelings. It, it, it incorporated that idea of universal consciousness of, of not just a deity, a man in the sky. That was my idea of God before then was like, oh, it's like some guy, some, some dude in the sky. But this introduced that concept of no, everything's intelligent. It's all God. It's all part of it. And you're part of it. You're an aspect of it. So this was the first kind of step on the road, right? But then a couple years down the line, I'd been researching philosophy and, and, and a bit of quantum physics and a bit of consciousness studies, you know, just layman, but just putting little pieces together intuitively and coming to different ideas about reality. And I found myself two years down the line in another depression. And this time it was because I felt like I had accumulated a lot of different knowledge and I'd got these insights about big ideas about reality. But none of it was helping me. Like none of it was doing anything in my life. My my daily stresses were still there and all the worries. And, you know, I was just feeling like it was all just pointless having all of this philosophical knowledge and ideas. So I was sitting on my bed one night, Sal. I was sitting on my bed and I guess you can call this a prayer, but I was just talking out loud. I was just talking out loud to the universe. I just said something along the lines of, look, just just give me something, give me something that works in this life. That is, that is representative of all this stuff I've been learning, all these things I've been drawing in for the last few years, prove to me it's real, prove to me that this, this is, this is something I should be following, that I should be going down. And then a week later, my best friend, he comes up to me and he's like, Hey, you've got to watch this documentary. I was like, Oh, what is it? He's like, it's uh, it's called unacknowledged by Dr. Stephen Greer. And obviously, Dr. Greer has made a few documentaries about the UFO subject. So I was like, okay, I'll watch it. I've never, this was my first introduction to the UFO subject. I hadn't thought about it before then. So my friend tells me about this documentary. I, I start watching it. And it talks about, obviously, you you know, he has some of the, like, the Minutemen missile launch officers and people in very high levels of uh, military and government talking about the subject. So I was suddenly sitting there going, okay, so there's something to this. There's, you know, these guys are very serious. There's got to be something going on here. But it was near the end of the documentary when this guy introduces the concept of CE5, this idea that you can initiate a form of contact through getting into meditative states, through projecting your intentions, through in some way performing a bit of a ritual and uh, and manifesting this stuff. And so, because I had been sitting on my bed that week prior, asking for something that I could do, something that I could do that would prove these ideas I had about consciousness, about universal mind, and suddenly a week later this guy is telling me that I can use my consciousness to have a, have contact scenarios with other intelligences, I think this was the key because it felt like an answer from God. And 
I couldn't ignore it. It literally, the moment this concept was introduced in this documentary, I was like, oh, there's the answer. That's what I was asking for, something I could do. So I went out into that backyard with zero doubt. Like you were saying before about intention and belief, I had full intention and belief. I was essentially like a converted religious believer. I had no reservations. And yeah, dude, I went out with no doubt and it worked. It worked. And since then, getting into the research field, you know, I've had my doubts about what it is. And I've had people from, you know, the intelligence community warning me about, you know, you shouldn't do that kind of stuff. There's dangerous things out there. And it's polluted my mind with it. It's put that seed of anxiety that wasn't there before. Before, it felt like an answer from God. And that's when I saw the orange orbs, when I was in this state of genuinely projecting love and positivity and this this desire to connect and this this curiosity it was very pure emotions that i was getting myself into the state of and these things turned up so yeah there was a really spiritual path that led me to those orange orbs my brother it was a very long and and you know there was pain and there was darkness and there was an up and down but there were messages there were synchronicities there were coincidences i couldn't ignore and it got to this point they turn up they change my life. I start putting a, a phone on a, on a tree branch and telling people and uploading it to YouTube. And now I'm doing this. Now I'm having conversations with people like you or other people within the government or within you know, media or journalism. And it's I, I sit there going, I can't believe any of this is actually happening. So it feels to me like as, as I don't want to sound egotistical. It just feels like I was guided. It feels like I was guided into this, that I'm supposed to be here. So yeah, there was a very you are, you are supposed to be here. How soon after the entities, after the event that you thought of Project Unity and coming up with these ideas and putting it together, how soon after? I think like a week, less than a week. Oh, sir. That's amazing. Yeah. It, cha it changed That's everything. Exactly it just the same thing that happened to the so-called ice effect. It's you, my brother are conduit so we are all conduit. if we let ourselves be we can all be conduits for these yeah. great ideas yeah because project unity is a great idea it's a great idea just like theories of everything again unification that's what we should aspire for not destruction but unification that's what the super intelligence I truly believe in pens it's what it's all about we need to come it. together otherwise yeah. we'll fall apart have you had any experiences yourself with anything strange in your life I wish I can say yes but I maybe because of the lack of sleep, but I don't sleep much. I have uh, it. I'm a strange creature. Let's just put it that whatever I am. But you know, I I yeah. Maybe you have to be in in the right frame of mind. Maybe, maybe. But maybe to me, this happened in a different way. Maybe these ideas. Yes. That we talk about right now is a manifestation of sorts. I refuse to believe that this thing just happened to me. I mean, how how in the world would a, a, a simple scaling analysis of the four equation, four unknown of the heavy side version of Maxwell equation ever have occurred to an aerospace engineer trained in fluid dynamics? Uh, you know, Frank White's fluid mechanics. That's what I grew up with. In Propera and DeWitt's uh, heat transfer. That's what I grew up with. And all of a sudden, I, I, I started developing this need to understand Maxwell's equation. Why? Again. You were guided to it. You were guided to it. So just like your orange orbs. The super floor. Why this need to put it down on paper and under any circumstance try to get it out there? 
again, I don't believe we discover these. We are just conduits for ideas. If Again, if we let ourselves be, every one of us is capable of these ideas. If we consider no reservations, no inhibitions, let it happen. But again, toward unification, not destruction. The answer is coming together, not falling apart. No. Coming together. For example, weak nuclear force. Weak. It's, it's in the name. It has to do with radioactivity. What's that about? Coming apart. Strong nuclear force. Unification. That's how the nucleus is formed. Yeah. Strong versus weak. Coming together versus falling apart. It's so freaking simple. And and it's layered. It's echoed through everything. So even down to the forces, this is evident. But then even just in terms of society, you know, spirit and science coming together or in intuition and love, everything has to come together on the micro to the macro. It's like it, it's all saying the same thing. It's all saying the same thing. Everything talks to a super force. Yeah. Yep. Driving to super bang, driving to a super intelligence. And this cycle keeps on going and going and going ad infinitum. That's oh. the true immortality. We never die, brother. I oh, refuse God. to believe that we just extinguished. All I this knowledge, know. all these ideas, it's always been there. We are all needed. We all have a purpose to serve. And we truly are servants of the super intelligence. Us in ourselves being able to generate this new AI, this artificial super intelligence, why would that be? Because we are part of, of the greater. We are part of the super intelligence. Yeah. That's what we're able to create. Yeah, it's like an echo. It's like an echo of that intelligence yes. coming through us, you know. Um, we're giving birth to what gave birth to us in some ways, you know. Um, as above, so below. As and above, so below. Better than that. Exactly. And it's been thousands wow. of years. Yes. You know, yeah, the simplest. Wow. Well, a bit like your formula, the, yeah. just a, a simple explanation. You know, I, I often think that you could almost look at some of these things like as above, so below. They're like philosophical formulas. They're like mathematics for the language. You know, it's like as That's above, so below. Must not be divorced from philosophy. Exactly, exactly. Unification. Yeah. I ask for reunification of physics and philosophy. Only yeah. then, only then I truly believe, let's call it, a new metaphysics will be born and not in the spirit of the word. Again, physicists, they deride metaphysics. But look at the basis of the word. Meta, everything, all, many and one yeah. physics. Why would they deride that which physics comes from? Anyway, I think we're just I think we're just shrugging off the old paradigm, Sal. I think we're, we're just, you know, getting ready to kind of break out of that old paradigm that we've been hanging on to for a long time. And and it's no longer adequate. It doesn't explain our position in the in reality anymore. And we're seeing that we're seeing the changes occur. So I like you. I'm optimistic that we're going to see it, my brother, in our lifetime. We're going oh, to see God, this, bro. you know, you're right. Yeah, um, it's it's we're breaking out of that uh, uh, the pupa stage. Yeah, yeah. I think the butterfly is about to come out. I was and just sometimes yeah. again order from chaos. Yeah, because within that pupa, my goodness, the molecular transformation, the metamorphosis. Yes, that <laughs> on that level, and something so beautiful comes out. Why? Yeah. Because at the basis of it is unification. I've used, I've literally used that exact same type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, metaphor. I really think it works because, as you said, the caterpillar turning into the butterfly, it's a destructive process. I mean, the transformation is radical. Everything, it's melted down to its most basic components. 
And if you look at the way the world is right now, does it not feel like we're in the chrysalis? Does it not feel like things are kind of getting broken down and turned and transformed? And if you think about what a caterpillar is, it's a ground-based consumer. It's a consumer of its ground-based environment. What's a butterfly? It's an airborne pollinator. It's a pollinator of its environment. So are we turning, are we turning from a planetary based consumer into a pollinator of the cosmos? Yes, we are. I think stellar, stellar propulsion, that it, it's there, bro. It, it's coming. Humanity it's, is the cosmic butterfly. But we are meant to go through these growing pains, just like birth. <laughs> the pains are excruciating. My goodness. Yeah. I can only think of what I, I remember my mother speaking to me and may she rest in peace. My mother, Florina was, is an amazing woman. The, when she described the birth pains that she, and eventually I came out of a C-section because she could not deal that that's how excruciating it was. And again, we are really going through these pregnancy pains, these yeah. growing pains. Yeah. But and do you something beautiful come out? Exactly. And even life, even just life, man, like just your individual life is full of up and down, light and dark, hot and cold, sadness, love. It's it's a part of the process. And you don't want to go through life without having a struggle, without having a problem, because these things, as much as they're uncomfortable, they're the things that grow you, that make you wiser, that give you character, that kind of form you into someone. So if we look at the human species as a as a as the collection as a singular body as a singular being growing up we're still young man and we're falling over we're tripping over evolution we're kind of you know bumbling our way but we're still growing we are still growing people look at the way the world is now and it just becomes depressing because you can't see how this could be beneficial uh, in the long run but that's exactly like your life when you're going through and maybe someone listening right now is going through that type of feeling, that feeling of nothing is good right now, but it always changes. The, there, one, brother. the Just, one guarantee, the, yeah, the one guarantee you can have, man, everything changes, everything shifts, good goes to bad, goes to good, goes to bad. That's the way that life works. So I look at the world today and I think, you know what? This to me is evidence that we're moving towards something better because right now it's fucking crazy. Super effing beyond words. <laughs> and I do I it's really, I mean, the answer is so simple. What but what drives us apart? What keeps us apart? There must be forces that keep us from unification. Because the ultimate need of the human event, of the human need to be, a need for existence is to unify, to come together. Yeah, to connect, man. To connect. You know, that's the most important thing. I mean, outside of that, there's not there's not much point. If if you're not connecting and sharing and growing like this, that's that's the human experience. That's what it is. You know, that's what it is. And so yeah, you're right. You know, that's that's what matters the most. And I, I think there is elements that's... I mean, look at our society. It doesn't want us to use our consciousness at that type of level. It's it's purpose... If not purposefully, then by some terrible accident, we've just set up a system that just suppresses consciousness. Um, which is why I genuinely am very happy to see psychedelics being studied again. And the psychedelic um, research is starting to come back into play because... You know, these are avenues through which science can start looking at these wider, more expanded senses of consciousness and begin to realize. Yeah, exactly, bro. The inner mind. You know? it, 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 it's almost as if on a genetic level, we were programmed to be depressed, right. to be downtrodden, to not to look toward elevation, toward uh, success, toward, again, unification. Yeah. It's as if we are meant to fall apart because it's not written in the stars, brother. What's wow. written in the stars is a super intelligence and the super intelligence speaks to a super force that speaks to unification. We are meant to come together. Something is preventing that. I will let you and others that follow you 
come to the idea of what that may be. But it shouldn't. We shouldn't let it, bro. Yeah, I think it's up to us. Our collective consciousness could maybe affect this counterforce. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to do, man. You know, that's that's what I'm trying to do in my in my humble I mean, way. Your mind was able to basically bring these orbs out of the quantum vacuum, right? Or need of another word. And then imagine what a collective. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's what really opened me up, man. I suddenly what just. Is all about. I just felt like. I just felt like if I can do this, anyone can do this. Anyone can do this. I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a meditation uh, yogi like a, like some Buddhist monk. I just got into a simple, simple state of mind. It wasn't hard. So I that that was what really fueled me. Was it just felt like, oh my god, everyone can do this. Magic, magic exists. There is some form of magic in this world. It's not all just gray and 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 boring and, and explainable. There is real mystery out there. And that's what made me just feel like I need to do this. And clearly, the same kind of in, intuitive inspiration and creativity is driving you with your physics and with your models, which again is why, even though I'm not a physicist, I have a lot of trust in you, Sal. I feel like there is something happening with the way that you're being Brother, a conjurer. Being a conjurer. One day I'll be proven correct. I and think you will. You know, I think you will. Why? Why that gives me? Because it came. It did not come from me. Yeah. I was just a conduit for it. It came from beyond, from the I believe, super intelligence. I believe you. And I am one hundred percent sure that one day the super force, the Pais effect, the room temperature, superconductor, piezoelectricity. I call the piezoelectricity induced room temperature superconductivity. That didn't come from me. I, I will tell you the truth that I just put it down on paper, just like yeah. you were saying. You yeah. Know, it just... It just kind of just flows out of you. Corpus. Yeah. If you look at this corpus of work, how how could this have been generated by a mechanical and aerospace engineer? To this day, I sometimes read my own work again. I'm like, who wrote that? <laughs> Dude, I yeah. Sounds. I, I will tell you. <laughs> so, I don't know, bro. I don't know. I I really think it exists. It's there. It's us. We must come together. That's the ultimate objective. Unification. Only that can drive us to understanding the super intelligence and growing metamorphosis that thing that larva that that what you call it ground feeder what not the, the pupa and what comes from it is just oh my goodness if you look inside the pupa and the chemical processes oh my goodness and what is the final result something that's capable of flight Flight, brother. Something ever since Icarus, human beings have aspired to. Maybe that's what it's all about. It's very symbolic, isn't it? Metam very symbolic. It it does seem to speak to the human evolutionary journey. And this is this is the process, my bro. This has been this has been such a fantastic conversation. Um I can't express how much I enjoyed it because this is honestly how I really love to have conversations with people just off the top of the head inspiration and creative and thinking about ideas and you know you uh you're you're a great guy man I like you Sal we're you're a great dude bro <laughs> and I really mean when I say brother I I call brother people that I really connect with that I feel, I feel you on that. I, call, I call Kurt brother and you, I call brother because I feel that connection. Yeah, yeah, I I I feel it too, man. Honestly, like I, we we will uh, we will have to meet up in real life and uh, we have to, bro. and uh, and really and have, have have another yeah. talk like this.
most definitely. Yeah. This, this, this was fun. Oh, this yeah, dude. Awesome. Yeah. Super awesome. Thank people you. Are, people are going to enjoy it. I guarantee you people are going to not. I, I don't think people I would. I hope so. I don't I'm think they would have expected this. Certain of the physicists will will double down on the yeah. Flag, flag, flag. Look at the whatever, <laughs> whatever. No, we had fun. Yeah, and we had fun, man. Something, some, something interesting. It did not even this this whole idea of pupa and metamorphosis never occurred to me before. Even that thing, that thing about the super intelligent, you know, the trifecta of yeah, emotions, yeah, yeah, super force to super bank to super intelligence. Only came to me maybe about half an hour as I was trying to put all this equipment together. I'm I'm not a I'm more of a theoretical type. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. I recognize my flaws, brother. I recognize them. Oh man, this yeah, this has been great. I wanna say I wanna say that we'll have to repeat this again and get you back. I, I like I said, I think people will be surprised that we went down this more philosophical route and i think they'll be pleasantly surprised because a lot of people that tune into you know my platform like going down that kind of uh, more philosophical perspective and having someone who is representing the science and representing the physics being in that philosophy corner as well it's good man it's where we need to be i i i, I really resonate with everything that you've been saying philosophy, but yeah man the voice brother no how we must bring them back together. Hundred percent. A new physics shall come. Hundred percent. Something so great, so beautiful that might, in a way, bring us to unification. Yeah, I hope this has given That's people. I hope this has given people some optimism in in this time. You should be optimistic, as much as it looks crazy out there. I think optimism is the best way to be right now because, in the long run, I think we're going to be okay. I think we're going to be okay in the long. Run. Sal, thank you so much, my brother. This was better. Yeah. A rare treat. A real treat. You really are a great man. Thank you. You I, too. I wish you the very best. Success in everything and all. 